It is a pleasure to welcome you to the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is an pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. It is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. Today's lecture is on advanced numerical methods and modeling in geotechnical engineering, which will be delivered by Professor Catherine O'Sullivan and Mr. David Wines. David is a principal engineer and director with Itasca Australia. He has a Bachelor of Geological Engineering from RMIT University and a Master of Mining Engineering from Curtin University. He also has the status of Chartered Professional Engineer with Engineers Australia. David has over 20 years of experience in geotechnical investigation and analysis for both mining and civil projects, including operational and consulting roles. Since joining Itasca 13 years ago, David has undertaken numerical back analyzers and forward analyzers for numerous open pit operations around the world. Okay, thanks for that, Arthur. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for joining. My presentation covers a lot of different topics, um, just general topics related to numerical slope stability analyses. Um, most of my background is in hard rock open pit mining, so. Um, the presentation sort of concentrates on that sort of area, but it's also relevant to uh, soil slopes and civil slopes, etc. Um, so some of the topics that I'll be talking about are the available techniques for slope stability analyses, including advantages and limitations, types of numerical analyses. I concentrate a little bit on comparing 2D to 3D models and just talk about some other general considerations such as the uh, which model inputs tend to be most important, the general model geometry and setup, groundwater and poor pressures, back analysis and calibration, interpretation of the modeling results, and also I talk about rock mass properties. So just very quickly, I don't want to make this a sales pitch, but just, to, just so people out there know, the company I work for, Itasca, uh, develops these software packages, which a lot of you may have heard of, which includes FLAC and FLAC 3D, UDEC and 3DEC and PFC. Um, so in terms of the available techniques for slope stability analyses, there are several techniques available from basic analyses right through to quite detailed numerical analyses. Um, limit equilibrium analyses have been used a lot for slope stability analysis, and it certainly has its place for a, a rapid um, modeling technique. And then I'm going to concentrate on talking about numerical methods. So the main advantages of using numerical models to analyze slope stability are that any failure mode can develop naturally. So you don't need to specify any sort of trial surface. Multiple failures can evolve naturally in a model. For many codes, there's no restriction on the model geometry and you can interrogate things like displacements and stresses and strains, which then allows you to compare the model behavior to what you measure out in the field. The disadvantages, the main disadvantages are um, the long model runtime. So for really complex numerical models, they can take quite a long time to construct the model and they can also take a, a pretty long time to run compared to more basic limit equilibrium analysis. So that definitely is a, a disadvantage. So just some of the types of numerical analyses, um, I guess the most basic is a continuum analysis where you have a mesh or elements that might represent say a rock mass or soil. Then you can step it up to include a lot more explicit structure in a discrete element method or distinct element method. And then there are other techniques which have already been spoken about similar to, to PFC, where you, you have balls that are sort of glued together. So continuum analyses include the finite difference method, which our task of software uses, and then finite elements methods are quite popular amongst other um, software packages. You can do slope stability analyses with 
a discontinuum or discrete or distinct element method where you include a lot of explicit structure. Um, these models can become quite large and complex, but we can run large scale models with, you know, hundreds of faults that are explicitly defined in the model. Um, we can also use discrete fracture networks to define the joint sets in a model um, and explicitly include thousands of joints in a numerical model. Once you start going to that sort of complexity, the models can become very large. So it does restrict the size of the actual slopes that you can analyze in the model if you're trying to put in uh, the actual jointing as it is. You can also use something like a PFC to analyze slope stability. Um, this is just an ex a 2D example here. Again, due to the computational intensity, the models start becoming very large once you start trying to analyze a very large slope. So one thing you can do, um, which is similar to what, what Pei was talking about before, you can look at a smaller scale in detail with some component tests and then input the findings of those smaller tests into a larger scale model. So this is just an example here where on the left we have a, um, a numerical triaxial test in three deck with quite a lot of structure in there, which might be say 10 meters high and five by five meters in plan. We can use that to try and understand the rock mass strength uh, with loading in dif different directions. And then we can use something like Flex 3D on the right here to analyze the, the actual slope, which might be that slope shown in that figure there might be 300 meters high. This is similar to using something like synthetic rock mass, um, where you're basically trying to create a numerical sample of the rock as it is. So you have the intact rock and you have the, you try and have the joints in there, the veining in there, et cetera, et cetera. And you do smaller scale component type tests to gain an understanding of how the rock mass will behave. And then you can use that to feed into larger scale models. Something that's a bit more recent is the, is the bonded block modeling approach, which um, can be used in, in 3DEC. And it basically involves a lot of blocks that are all bonded together and then failure can occur in between those blocks um, to represent intact rock failure or even failure along existing discontinuities. And that's sort of similar to um, what Madhumita was talking about in, in UDEC using the Voronoi technique. I think it's a similar sort of um, idea behind that. So it's important when you are doing any slope stability analysis to think about what the, the key mechanisms may be and whether your adopted modeling methodology can actually represent those mechanisms. For a hard rock situation, most of the time the failures will be structurally controlled so you really need to have those key structures represented in the model to provide reliable stability estimates. So I just want to talk a little bit now about two-dimensional versus three-dimensional analyses. I wrote a paper in 2016 where I compared some 2D to, 2D to 3D analyses. So I think 2D analyses can be very valuable. Um, they are faster to build and run, um, but there are of course limitations because a lot of the time, a lot of the model inputs really are 3D in nature. For example, the slope may be concave or convex in plan. The orientation of the structures with respect to the excavation face may be important. The geotechnical domains um, are normally 3D in nature. In situ stresses may be different in different directions. Pore pressures will be 3D in nature quite often. Um, this is just an example of how the factor of safety can increase as a slope becomes more concave. Um, and that's due to the confinement, the lateral confinement provided by the concave geometry. This is just an example I provided of a, an actual failure that occurred in a gold mine in Western Australia. You can see the top left figure shows a failure 
a structurally controlled failure that occurred in a little bull nose or convex geometry. So I back analyzed that in 3D to come up with a factor of a safety of around one. And then I made the, the slope straight with all of the same model inputs and the same structures and the factor of safety then went up to 1.5. So it's just basically showing that when you have this sort of convex geometry due to the lack of lateral confinement, uh, the stability may be reduced. So it's nice to try and avoid those sorts of convex geometries, particularly in a hard rock environment. Another issue is um, with 2D analyses, it's basically assuming that everything um, at that section location is consistent along the slope. So in this sort of case where you have a, a structure that's oblique to the slope, you might require some breakout through the rock mass on the left hand side here. Whereas in 2D, it can just simply come out and fail along that structure. So another example that I show here is again from a, a mine in Western Australia. This failure occurred. <clears throat> the top left here shows the failure with a controlling structure at the back and there was rock mass breakout on the left hand side or the northern side there. So I back analyzed this in three dimensions shown in the bottom left to come up with a factor of safety of around one um, because this slope stood there for quite a while before it failed. So we thought that the, the factor of safety would have been around one. Then at the bottom right, I show there a 2D analysis. Um, so that 2D analysis has, analysis has all of the same model inputs as the 3D model, but it produces a factor of safety of 0.65. So you can see a very big difference between the 2D and 3D analysis results with all of the same model inputs. So that the main reason for the difference is that the 2D model doesn't care about or recognize the fact that there needed to be any rock mass breakout on the northern side of the failure. This is another example from a mine in Papua New Guinea where several 2D analyses had been run through the, the southwestern slope here. And that slope happened to have at the section location happened to have relatively weak rock mass right down the slope. So the 2D analyses were producing deep seated circular type failure mechanism um, with a relatively low factor of safety. When you looked at it in 3D, as shown in the top right here, these darker colored materials are, are much stronger uh, areas of rock mass, whereas the lighter colored material where the 2D section passed through is much weaker. So in 3D, um, we actually ran the model in 3D and the factor of safety was, was much, much higher because basically for this deep seated mechanism that was represented by the 2D analyses, you would need to have a a um, 150 meter wide, 450 meter deep section fail, which is almost impossible when you have these stronger materials on either side of the, the 2D section. So again, if you look down the bottom right here, the 2D section, because of its location, doesn't care about the stronger materials to the, the north and the south. Um, so just some other, um, discussions on general considerations. This year I presented a paper at Slope Stability 2020 in Perth uh, where I ran a lot of analyses to try and look at what the most important inputs were for slope stability analyses. Um, it's just a bit of a summary here. Not surprisingly for the factor of safety, the strength properties are, are the most important. That's the strength of the soil or the rock mass or the discontinuities. Pore pressures will tend to be very important as well. Um, I was surprised at how significant the density could be. Um, so I guess it's good to keep in mind that density is not necessarily just a sort of secondary parameter and it's certainly something worth getting right in these analyses. The in-situ stresses in a hard rock environment can influence the modeling results. Um, quite often we don't have any real idea of the in situ stresses, unfortunately. Um, the adopted elastic properties 
which are the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, uh, will often have a significant effect on the model displacements, but not so much on the, the factor of safety. That does depend on the, the constitutive model that you're using. Um, the elastic properties may have more effect if you're using a, a strain softening type model. Um, of course, taking a step back from the, the actual modeling, understanding the geology and the structures is always extremely important for any of these analyses. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where failures, slope failures have occurred in hard rock environments and they haven't been predicted by the modeling. And a lot, for a lot of those cases, the key structures that controlled the failures um, had not been identified at the time of modeling, so they weren't in the model. Um, of course, it's hard for the model to create the, the failure if the key structures aren't in there. Um, there are, of course, other, other issues that can be very, very important um, that are just numerical modeling issues, such as boundary locations. You don't want your boundaries to be too close to the, the slope. There are general guidelines provided here. Um, the zone size or um, resolution of your model is very important as well. You need to have adequate zone resolution over the, the area that you are analyzing. So you need to decide on uh, what you're really trying to analyze. Are you trying to analyze the, the stability of the overall slope or the individual batters or whatever it may be? Um, but if your zone size is too large, that can override anything else and just make the, uh, make the modeling results unreliable. Another issue with, with zone size is related to other features. Um, so with, with faults, for example, um, we can put those explicitly into a model so along those explicit features, you can have shear and separation, which is a nice way to do it. Another way is to represent a fault zone using the model zones or elements as shown in the, the red line here or the red area. So if you have a fault zone that's 20 meters thick or something like that, you may want to represent it using the, uh, the finite difference or finite element mesh you just need to make sure that you have enough zones across that area for it to be able to um, resolve some sort of failure. There's no use having a fault zone that just has one, one model zone across the thickness because it won't be able to uh, resolve any failure along that feature, even if you do assign lower material strength. Um, pore pressures are very important. Quite often for slope stability analyses, we only have a phreatic surface and we might assume a, assume hydrostatic conditions below that surface. Um, this can be okay, but it can uh, misrepresent the actual pressures. Um, you can also have hydrogeological numerical analyses done and use those as inputs to the, the stability analyses, or you can do it all in a fully coupled manner in the one model. And some previous workers have provided a, a suggestion as to the, the permeability that um, could be used as a, an indication as to whether you should do um, coupled analyses. Um, just talking about back analysis and calibration. So back analyzing actual failures is by far the best way to verify the model inputs. Um, you really want to be able to successfully recreate any previous instability. Um, one point I would make is that the inputs that you use to successfully recreate a failure are not necessarily unique. So there could be a, um, different combinations of inputs um, may successfully recreate a failure. So if you have a successful back analysis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know exactly what all the, all the properties are. Um, quite often we will do a calibration to observe displacements in a slope that hasn't failed. And I think this is a worthwhile process, uh, but we just need to be realistic about uh, what we achieve 
because we, if we can uh, provide a good correlation between the model and observed displacements in a stable slope, that might just mean that we have a good understanding of the, the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, but we still could have um, very inaccurate strength properties in our model. Um, so again, the best way to verify those properties is to back analyze actual failures. Sometimes you have slopes with no failures, so you can't do that. Uh, just talking about model interpretation, obviously numerical analyses produce displacements and everyone can sort of understand displacements are quite intuitive. Um, but I'd also encourage people to look at other indicators as well, like numerical velocity and plasticity um, to assess uh, stability. Um, we tend to use velocity thresholds to assess whether a slope is stable in our model. Um, so you can include displacement monitoring points in the model on the slope, which are very, very valuable. And in a typical analysis, if the slope fails, you should see those displacements increasing as you run the model. That should be quite clear. And if the slope's stable, the, uh, the displacement should basically flatline as you run the model. So that, that can be just another backup to help to decide whether the slope is stable or unstable in your model. Um, Another important issue is looking at, quite often we'll look at whether uh, excavation of a slope might cause damage to surrounding infrastructure. And I would recommend people to not look at displacement magnitudes um, in that case and to look at strains instead. Um, displacements don't necessarily mean all that much um, on their own. It's really the differential displacements or strain that matter. If you think of a house and one corner of the house drops, then you have, you have a big issue and you may get cracking and so on. Whereas if the whole thing drops by the same amount, it's not such an issue. So there are published uh, thresholds for strain um, that could cause damage to masonry structures and dams and things like that. And in a numerical model, you can look at the, the strains and try to use that to predict whether um, damage may occur to, to surrounding infrastructure. Or you can take it another step up and there are other methods, published methods available like this one here where they use a combination of horizontal strain and angular distortion to, um, to assess damage. So you can write this sort of thing into your numerical model and then plot contours of, of potential damage um, adjacent to a slope. Um, you know for limit equilibrium analyses they will easily produce a factor of safety which can be quite or be very valuable in uh, determining the acceptability of a slope design. Um, for a numerical analysis if you run the model and it's stable that really doesn't tell you all that much it just tells you that the factor of safety is at least one which really isn't sufficient to, uh, to make a decision on the acceptability of that slope. So we have a strength reduction approach that we use to estimate the factor of safety. So basically this involves reducing the strength properties until failure occurs. And then the factor of safety is defined as the actual strength divided by the strength re required to maintain stability. Um, in my case, I, I'll always reduce the strength of everything when I do these strength reduction analyses. So the strength of the soil, of the rivers, et cetera. And I will include the tensile strength in those calculations. Quite a lot of the literature just reduces the shear strength, which will normally be the cohesion and friction angle. But I think it's, it's correct to reduce all of the strength properties for everything when you do these analyses. Another issue is uh, probability of failure. Um, so with limit equilibrium analysis, uh, a, a real advantage is that you can run a Monte Carlo type simulation where every single calculation 
can sample uh, from the distribution of the different model inputs. Um, and you can quite quickly come up with probability of failure estimates. Because uh, with numerical analyses, each model run just with one set of inputs can take quite a long time. So it's essentially impossible to do a, a Monte Carlo type simulation within the numerical model to come up with a probability of failure. So we use other techniques such as the response surface method. I've got some, uh, just list some references here. But basically what you need to do with this method is to decide which model inputs are going to affect your factor of safety. And then you, then you run separate numerical analyses and you change one input at a time. So you might have your, a minimum cohesion and a maximum cohesion and a base case cohesion. And that allows you to understand how that particular parameter affects the factor of safety. And then you can use the response surface approach within something like at risk in Excel to then produce a, uh, a distribution of factor of safety. And then from that, you can estimate the probability of failure. So it is possible to use numerical analyses to come up with a probability of failure, um, but it can be quite time consuming. Uh, just a quick discussion on rock mass properties. So the hook brown criterion is often used to estimate uh, the rock mass strength. Um, this includes a disturbance factor, which you may have heard of, which in theory varies from zero for undisturbed rock masses to one for very disturbed rock masses. Um, this can be a, a significant issue. The D factor um, will significantly reduce the strength of um, the rock mass and quite often the factor of safety as well. So for the paper that I recently wrote, I, I did a little test on this model here, which was analyzing just purely rock mass failure. And you can see that the factor of safety goes from about 2.9 down to about 1.5 when you increase the D factor from zero to one. Um, there's just another statement here from the paper. So for this particular example, if you reduce the D factor from one to 0.7, which is typical sort of values that are sometimes used immediately behind the excavation face, even that is similar to increasing the UCS from 50 to 115 MPA. So I guess the point I make is that you, you could spend a lot of money trying to refine the knowledge of the UCS and GSI and other rock mass type parameters uh, through drilling programs and so on. And then that can be overwritten by just changing the D factor. So it's something we need to be very careful, careful with. Uh, part of the D factor is to allow for blasting. How deep will the, the effect of blasting be? There are some guidelines provided in this reference. My feeling is blast damage is normally relatively shallow, um, maybe 15 meters or something like that. Another issue that is spoken about in the Hook Brown papers is uh, stress relaxation. Um, and drilling has verified that effect next to open pits. So um, one way of uh, accounting for that in a numerical model is to use a strain softening type constitutive model. So the strength of the material can actually reduce as strain occurs in the model. Um, a lot of modeling is, is undertaken using more cool on perfectly plastic constitutive models where the strength of the material does not reduce when failure occurs, which can be okay. You just need to keep, keep those things in mind. Um, so there's a couple of references I provide here where uh, some, some people have proposed ways of um, including a disturbed zone for models where you're assuming perfectly plastic behavior, which can be quite useful. Um, another issue that can be relevant, I think, for slopes is the scale effects. Uh, so the theory is that uh, the rock mass at the small scale, say around a tunnel, may be a lot stronger than the larger scale rock mass that might be in a large slope. And synthetic rock mass testing has shown this with the, the strength reducing as the, the sample size is increased. Um, 
another interesting point on rock mass properties. Um, <clears throat> some other other workers have uh, run some some analyses in flax slope slope analyses, and they found that if they included some variability in the rock mass strength based on the actual known variability in the field. Uh, the factor of safety was always less than when they just assumed the average properties in the model, which is what we we most often do. We'll most often have a domain and it might have a certain one certain set of properties within that domain instead of having uh, variation within the model in that domain. So what this does tell us is that the failures will tend to seek out the path of least resistance. So if you have spread out throughout your slope, you have some weaker areas, some stronger areas and some average strength areas, the failure uh, surface will tend to seek out those weaker areas. And in theory, in a numerical model, you can um, try to represent that variability throughout the model because each each individual zone could have different properties. So if you have a good understanding of the that variability, you could sample the strength um, and spread it throughout a particular domain. Um, and quite often we do that when there are block models available for something like the geological strength index and we can sample from those block models. <clears throat> Another issue related to rock mass strength too is the um, potential bias where uh, when labs are taken from drill hole core, the samples will tend to be taken from the better quality material because that's what will actually have core in the core tray. So if there's some very poor quality <coughs> areas um, of rock mass, there, there might not be any core to sample anyway. So we just need to keep in mind that um, the lab testing can potentially uh, be biased towards the better quality material. Um, just some other general considerations. <clears> there <throat> will always be uncertainty associated with most of the model inputs, so it's therefore a good idea to always perform sensitivity studies, which should include lower bound runs uh, to... Th these sensitivities don't necessarily have to be used as the the sort of base case for design, but they can help to identify potential failure mechanisms that can be looked at more closely. One big issue I think is the, the potential effects of rainfall. And I think that's something that we, we quite often miss. Very, very often failures occur after significant rainfall events. So I think we would find that a lot of analyses would be undertaken based on the sort of best estimate day-to-day -day pore pressures. Um, but when you get significant rainfall, you know, 100 mils or 200 mils or something falling in a day or two, the pore pressures in the slope can increase significantly and they don't need to increase for long um, for failure to occur. So if you have a, a rapid increase in, in transient pore pressures, uh, those, those really high pressures that may exist for a day or a week are the ones that really matter. It's not the, it's not the ones that the lower pressures that exist for uh, the rest of the year. It's not always the final slope that will be the most critical in terms of stability. The final slope in any particular situation might be the deepest and it may be the steepest, but there could be some interim stage that is actually more critical in terms of stability. The pore pressures may be more critical at some earlier stage or some sort of interim slope might be just at the wrong location in relation to a large fault that actually makes that interim slope a lower factor of safety than the final slope. Um, so in an ideal world, it's good to analyze the different stages of a slope. It's not always that easy because um, you might not have the time to do that, but it's just good to keep that in mind. I uh, just missed one point there that when you do perform those sensitivity analyses, I would recommend just changing one model input at a time. Otherwise, you just, you don't have any idea what's going on. If you change, say, five inputs, and then you run the model, you don't know what each of those, each of those uh, parameters is actually doing. 
Um, just another point that different modeling techniques may produce different results. And we saw that where I compared the 2D to the 3D analyses with the factors of safety. So just a point on that is that you, you can't necessarily grab say a report where there's been some 2D limit equilibrium back analyses done and then take those back, back analysis properties and put them into a 3D numerical forward analysis, for example. Um, sometimes it's hard to avoid that, but it's not ideal because we know that the different techniques can produce different results. Um, it's always good to double check all your model inputs before running the model. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and it's always nice to take a step back and think about what you're actually analysing and the potential mechanisms, what you might expect to be the most likely mechanisms based on the geology and the structures and so on. Um, and think about the historical stability at the, whatever the slope is that you, you're analysing and just try and think um, whether your, your modelling results actually make sense. Quite often, if they don't make sense at all, um, there's something wrong in your model. For example, if there's an existing slope um, and it's been stable for 50 years and you, you're producing a low factor of safety um, for something that's very similar, then you need to really double check everything in your model because there might be something fundamentally wrong. So I've included all the references in this, um, in this presentation, um, which will be available. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks very much everyone for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks David. Let's take the first question. A rock slope model, what is the best mesh size and boundary condition to be assigned to the slope problem? Um, if I go back, there is this general guideline in the um, open pit slope stability guidelines book that provides an indication of um, of the different extents of the model. I tend to be uh, quite conservative and just push the boundaries back quite a long way. Uh, you, you can keep in mind that you can grade the, the zone size out a lot as you move away from the slope. So once you start getting away from where any failure may occur, you can uh, grade out to a very large zone size. You really just want those boundaries to be pushed out so that you make sure you get the stresses right. For our models, for a, a, a slope that might be 250 metres to 750 metres high or something like that, our zone size in the vicinity of the slope might be uh, five metres or something like that. Um, so it'd have a five metre zone size uh, just behind the slope. If it was much smaller, if you're looking at like a civil type batter that was 25 metres high, then I'd be wanting to have a, maybe a one, one metre zone size or something like that adjacent to the, the slope. So it does depend on the, the actual scale that you're looking at. So in this particular case here, with this figure, if each of these batters had two or three zones over the height of the batter, then it's not really good enough to analyze the individual batter stability. I think you really want to have, you know, probably 10 zones up, up each of the individual uh, slopes to provide reliable stability estimates. Okay, let's take the next question, um, which comes from Laura uh, from Norway. Uh, she has two questions essentially. Uh, the initial conditions are very important in these kind of models and she says that how do you choose the initial conditions for your model and which strains obtaining soil model do you use and if it is only for rock or it's a generalized model? Um, well, the initial conditions, it really, it's quite often, often an issue for us because we don't know what the in-situ stresses are. Sometimes when we do open pit mining analyses, if there's a, an associated underground mine, there might be quite a lot of in situ stress testing and we can use that um, to help us with the, the initial conditions. Um, but even then the test might be way below the base of the pit. So sometimes we will look at published 
data on regional in situ stresses and try and estimate from that um, what we should use. But basically, yeah, for our initial conditions in the hard rock, we will include whatever stresses we think are there, and we might do some some uh, sensitivities on that. And then in the upper upper layer, if it's soil or something like that, then we, we make sure that we don't have some high horizontal stresses because we don't think they would they would exist. We just allow it to basically allow the stresses to develop, to develop um, based on the vertical stresses uh, in that soil. And then with the strain softening, there's various models available. Um, uh, most of my work's in hard rock, so we use the the strain softening models in, in flak 3D and 3D. There are several other soil models available in Itasca software and other, other software packages as well, um, which I'm certainly no expert in. But um, yeah, we, we have a, a sort of in-house strain softening rock mass model that we use. And we've also used the subiquitous model um, a lot in flak 3D and 3D. Um, and you kept, you could use the basic strain softening model to represent a soil as well. Um, let's go ahead with the next one. This comes from Ali from Iran. How do we understand our problem in the calibration phase is deal with string parameters, not with the constitutive models which we have chosen? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I guess you've just got to, <laughs> you've got to select your constitutive model um, select what you think's appropriate and then have a good go at trying to recreate the, the failure. Um, but yeah, it could be, if you can't recreate a failure, you might have the properties wrong or the constitutive model might not be appropriate. It could be either of them. Um, so I guess you just have to decide on the constitutive model first and make a decision as to whether it's appropriate. And if it is, then you run a lot of, a lot of analyses to try and recreate the failure. It can, it can be extremely difficult to recreate failures because quite often we don't, we just don't have all of the information. And I've had, I've had it a lot of times you run 40 models and, and then eventually the mind might come to you and say, Oh, we found this other structure and you put that in your model and it just fails. So it's, it's extremely open-ended and difficult. Um, it, it, it can be really, really hard. I've, I've spent months trying to back analyze certain failures and other ones you, you build the model and run it and it recreates it first time. If it's a wedge or something that's controlled by two intersecting structures, it should be easy. If it's something else where you can't even tell really what the mechanism is and there's unknown structure involved, it can be extremely difficult. So yeah, it could sometimes maybe your constitutive model isn't appropriate. Other times your properties are just wrong. Let's take this one. So this one comes from Raman and he says that if there is a ratio that you use to compare 3D versus 2D models, for example, if it's a deflection or something, or something like a plane strain ratio, a multiplication factor that you can use to convert 2D to 3D. No, no it's a good question. I wonder if, if you look through the literature, maybe something exists, but I don't think it's necessarily as simple as it being, you know, higher for one and lower for the other. It just depends on the particular thing that you're analyzing. If you're looking at a concave slope, maybe you could, you could come up with some sort of factor. If you had a perfectly concave slope and you looked at the, the um, radius of curvature, you could come up with some multiplication factor. But if you, if you're looking at most real slopes, I reckon sometimes 2D factor safety may be higher than 3D. Sometimes it might be the other way around. So it's very hard to do that. But yeah, for something like a really basic concave slope, you could probably come up with a, some sort of factor, but then it might vary depending on the material properties and the, um, the groundwater and stresses and things like that. But yeah, there might be something out there. I think if you look at the charts in my 2016 paper where I did some basic analyses for concave slopes, you could come up with some sort of factor from those charts that I created there, but I'd be very, very careful in doing that. 
Thanks very much, everyone, for listening.